Happy Pi Day! To celebrate Pi Day this year, I'm explaining 10 pi approximation formulas. Some of these are easy and most of you will understand. Some of these are a bit harder and will require stuff like calculus and trig identities. And some of these are downright incomprehensible. But don't leave when you find the formulas too hard. Just watch for the fun of the formulas. And let's see how accurate some of these can get. I've coded up Python implementations of all of them using the Precision Floating Point Arithmetic Library MP Math. And links to all my sources as well as my code will be in the description. Okay, so the first one is based on the area of a circle. So we all know that the area of a circle with radius r, star good circle, um, is pi r squared. Proving this is a bit hard, one of the ways we can do that is by cutting up the circle into different parts and then rearranging them into a sort of rectangle that's kind of round. And then you know that the length of this rectangle is half the circumference, and you know that the height is r, and we know that the circumference is equal to 2 pi r because of the definition of pi. This is how, well, pi is defined some other ways too. So we know that the area of this rectangle is going to be c over 2 times r, which is 2 pi r squared over 2, which is pi r squared. You may have seen this proof before. I think it's quite nice. So how we do this is we graph a square, and then we also graph a circle inside of it. If we let the center of this whole diagram be 0, 0, and plot everything along the x and y axes, let this point be 1, 1, this point be negative 1, negative 1, let this point be 1, 0, we can tell if a point lies inside the circle by checking that its distance to the origin squared is less than or equal to r squared. Now, after plotting a bunch of points, some of them are going to be inside the circle and some of them are going to be outside. If we take the ratio inside to total, we would expect this to be roughly proportional to the area of the circle, which is pi, over the area of the square, which is 4, because of how probabilities work out. So if we find this ratio for like a million points and we multiply it by 4, we'll probably get pi. Now let's see this in action. I have this coded up right here. We're going to do a million points. For each of them, they're going to be inside the box from negative 1 to 1 for both x and y. We're going to check that their distance to the origin squared is at most 1, because if so, they're going to be inside that circle. And then we take the ratio and multiply it by 4. Now let's see how many correct digits this gets. It gives 3.142328, which is not quite the exact value of pi. I'm checking against this giant file here, which has a million digits of pi, and it only got two of them after the decimal point. So we're going to say that the accuracy of this is three digits. Okay, number two is based on the volume of a sphere. So we're upgrading from two to three dimensions. Now we're going to be picking random points inside the box, still ranging from negative one to one for all of the coordinates, but this time we're going to embed a sphere inside the box. Choosing points at random, we would expect that the ratio of the points inside the sphere to the points in total is going to approximate the volume of the sphere, which is 4 thirds pi r cubed, divided by the volume of the box, which is 8. We can find the volume of the sphere by either calculating a double integral. So once we have this ratio is equal to 4 thirds pi r cubed over 8, we know that r is equal to 1. So we're going to have pi equals ratio times 8 over 4 thirds. Now let's look at the code. We're going to be picking random points in three dimensions inside this box. So we're going to have an x, y, and z coordinates. We can tell if they're inside the sphere by summing up the squares of their coordinates because that's the square distance to the origin. If it's within one, it's inside the sphere, so we're going to add one. And at the end, we take our ratio, which is inside divided by total amount, multiply it by eight, and multiply it by three fourths, which is the same as dividing by four thirds. Now, if we do this a million times, let's see how many digits we can get we also get three digits. So we're gonna say that the accuracy of this one is also three digits. Okay, you all know that we aren't stopping at three dimensions, so here's a hypersphere of radius one contained inside a box of side length two. We're gonna use the same process as before, picking random points inside this box and seeing if they land inside the hypersphere. And the ratio that we get of points inside over points in total should be roughly equal to the volume of the hypersphere over 16. Now the volume of the hypersphere is pretty fun, it's pi squared over 2 times r to the 4, and in this case r is equal to 1, so the volume is just pi squared over 2, meaning that this is equal to pi squared over 32. And now let's take a look at the code. 
Here we're going to need four coordinates instead of three, but the distance to the origin squared is still the same. It's just summing up the squares of all the coordinates. At the end, we still obtain the same ratio, multiply by 32, and take the square root to get pi. Now let's see how many digits this gives us. Three. Okay, the same as all the others. So the accuracy of this one is still three. Okay, it looks like all this area probability approximation stuff isn't working out so well. So let's try something else. Let's try some algebra. The Basel problem is concerned with the infinite sum 1 over 1 squared plus 1 over 2 squared plus 1 over 3 squared, etc. plus 1 over n squared, so on until infinity. And we know that this equals pi squared over 6. Now this might be a bit counterintuitive. Why is there a pi in here? Uh, 3 blue one brown has a great video on this and I highly suggest you check it out but it's a bit of a complicated problem so I won't prove it here. Let's take a look at the code. This function over here computes up to a million terms of this sum and then it returns the sum times 6 square rooted which should approximately equal pi. Let's see how many digits this can compute with a million terms. Okay it looks like even with a million terms it only got 3.14159. So we're going to say the accuracy of the Basel approximation is six digits. Okay, let's try a different infinite sum, the Leibniz sum. It goes 1 over 1 minus 1 over 3 plus 1 over 5 minus 1 over 7, so on, is equal to pi over 4. So this sum is the reciprocal of all the odd integers alternating between plus and minus. Let's see how well this fares in code with a million iterations. Okay, it looks like this is also computing six digits. So we're not quite there, but at least we haven't gone down in accuracy. Now let's try some trigonometry with the Machen-like formulas. There are two things we need to know here. The first is the tangent addition formula. If we have two angles, alpha and beta, and we add them together taking their tangent, this is equal to tan alpha plus tan beta divided by one minus tan alpha times tan beta. Now the second thing we need to know is the Taylor series approximation of arc tangent. And if we look this up on Wolfram Alpha, we see that it is x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5 over 5 minus x to the 7 over 7 and so on. This is derived by taking successive derivatives of arc tangent, multiplying them by powers of x and dividing by some factorial. That's how Taylor series work. But all we need to know is that arc tan of x is equal to x minus x cubed over 3 plus x to the 5 over 5 minus x to the 7 over 7 and so on. Maybe I'll do a video in the future about Taylor series, uh, but for now this is all you need to know. You might notice that this looks really similar to the Leibniz formula, and indeed it is. It is exactly arctangent of 1. That gives the Leibniz formula. And in fact we do know that arctangent of 1 is equal to pi over 4 because a line that makes an angle of pi over 4 with the x-axis has a slope of 1. Okay, combining these two things, we can get the Machen-like formula. One example is arctangent of 1 half plus arctangent of 1 third. Now I'm going to write a tan instead of arctangent because it's just easier to write. Now we want to find what the sum of these two numbers equals, and to do that we can simply take the tangent of their sum. Using this formula over here, we get that this is equal to tangent of arctangent of one half plus tangent of arctangent of one third over one minus tangent of arctangent of one half times tangent of arctangent of one third. And thankfully this simplifies into one half plus one third over one minus one half times one third, which is equal to five sixths over five sixths, which is one. And therefore, tangent of this thing equals 1, which means that this thing is equal to pi over 4. This is the core idea of the Machen-like formulas. The original formula, which we can find on Wikipedia, that uh, John Machen found was pi over 4 equals 4 times arctangent of 1 fifth minus arctangent of 1 over 239. And we can prove that this is true by using the tangent addition formula that we mentioned earlier. And now let's see how well this fares in code. First, we have a function to compute the arctangent of any input using the Taylor series approximation. And we're using 10 to the 5 terms here for a reasonable amount of terms. And then we have this main function that computes pi using the Machen-Lake formulas. 
First one is just our tangent of 1, that equals pi over 4, so we multiply that by 4 to get an approximation for pi. The next one is the first one I talked about, arc tangent of 1 half plus arc tangent of 1 third should equal pi over 4. And the last one is John Mockin's original formula. Let's see how many digits each of these gives. So the first one gives 5, the next two give 16. There are in fact a whole bunch of these Mockin-like formulas. Uh, some of them are more complicated than others and therefore some of them are more accurate than others. But we're going to say this has an accuracy of 5 to 16 for our small cases. And now let's get into a bit more calculus with the integrals. First of all is the circle integral. Over here we have a graph of the function y equals square root of 1 minus x squared. It's the first quadrant of a circle with radius 1. Now the area of this circle should equal pi over 4. It is also equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of 1 minus x squared dx. Now if we evaluate this integral, it should equal pi over 4. Let's see how to do it in code. I'm kind of cheating a little bit here by using built-in functions from the mpmath library, uh, but I think this is perfectly valid. So let's see how many digits this gives. Okay, and stunningly, if we set the precision to 1,000 decimal digits, it gets 999 of them right. So we could easily increase the amount of precision that we do here um, and get even more digits of pi. Now, this really depends on the implementation of the integral you're doing. I could have coded up my own integral function, but there's a whole family of algorithms for computing integrals, which I'm not going to go into too much depth right here in this video. So we're just going to use the provided functions in the library. In a future video, I might actually talk about how computers compute integrals. So let me know down in the comments if you would like to see that happen. Anyways, we're going to say for 7, the circle integral accuracy is a lot. In fact, at least a thousand digits. And for our next integral, we're going to look at the Gaussian integral. This is the integral from negative infinity to infinity, so it's indefinite, of e to the negative x squared dx. And this equals root pi. So here's a graph of the function that we're integrating. Um, the area under this curve in blue should be equal to root pi. I'm actually going to derive how one does this. Basically, you square the thing and you write it in two variables, x and y. And this gets transformed into a double integral across the entire real plane of e to the negative x squared plus y squared dx dy. And now this x squared plus y squared motivates polar coordinates. So to do polar coordinates, we go from 0 to 2 pi for theta and 0 to infinity for r of e to the negative r squared r dr d theta. Because remember, when we're doing polar coordinates, this is our differential. So this is for all of you uh, taking multivariable calculus in high school or college. Now, simplifying this is uh, quite easy. Taking the antiderivative of this bit is just e to the negative r squared over 2. And evaluating this gives 1 half. Now we're just taking the integral from 0 to 2 pi of 1 half d theta, uh, which happens to equal pi. Now since we uh, squared the original integral, we need to take the square root of pi to get its original value. So there we go. And let's see how this holds up in code. Now given 150 decimal digits of precision, it gets 149 of them right. So we're going to say this accuracy is quite high with at least 150 decimal digits. Now it is a bit slower because we're evaluating quite a complicated integral. And again, I am using the built-in library functions. So you probably wouldn't use this to approximate pi. Okay, the next one is the Chudnovsky algorithm. And it has a lot of big numbers. And that's all I'm going to write here. Because this is what the formula looks like. It looks like this. It is absolutely ridiculous. Has tons of big numbers, factorials, exponents, as well as an infinite sum. So let's take a look at the code. I actually did implement this one. We're just computing the infinite sum for about a thousand terms. I made sure to type all these numbers very carefully into the script. Basically, this sum is equal to some number divided by pi. So once we get the infinite sum, we cancel out the numerator and take the reciprocal. So let's see how many digits this can compute. Turns out it can compute at least 10,000 digits quite quickly. And finally, we're going to talk about the gauss legendre pi approximation algorithm. So we're going to need four variables here. We have ai, bi, ti, and pi. 
Initially, AI starts out as 1, BI starts out as 1 over root 2, TI starts out as 1 fourth, and PI starts out as 1. So we're going to do four updates at every step for each of the variables. The first one is AI is equal to AI minus 1 plus A plus BI minus 1 over 2. The next update for TI is a bit weird. It says TI is equal to TI minus 1 minus PI minus 1 minus AI times AI minus AI minus 1 squared. The last one is PI uh, just doubles. So if you run this algorithm enough times, pi can be approximated as AI plus BI squared over 4 times TI. And there's a bunch of ways you can prove this, and there's probably some interesting story about how this was derived, uh, but this algorithm converges very rapidly, so the number of digits you get doubles for every iteration you do. So this one is obviously going to be the best, uh, but it's also going to be a little bit slow. Let's take a look at how the code holds up. We're going to do just 16 iterations of this algorithm, uh, and limiting up to 100,000 digits, we get... 99,999 of them. Uh, so that's pretty impressive. So definitely Gauss Legendre is the most accurate method we have of finding pi and the quickest that we have here. So we're going to say the accuracy of Gauss Legendre is the most at 10 to the 5 digits of pi. Now let's do a summary of all 10 algorithms. The first one, using the circle points in a box algorithm, gave us three digits. The next one with the sphere also gave us three digits. And the third one with the hypersphere um, also gave us three digits. Now, the accuracy of these is relatively low because we're using random numbers and finding a proportion between points inside and outside, and that's not guaranteed to work all the time. Now, moving on to the next one, uh, we had the Basil problem, and that gave us five digits, which was certainly an improvement. And the next one, Leibniz, also gave us five digits. These were both infinite sums, which we computed somewhere around a million terms of. The next one, with the Machen-like formula, had Taylor series approximations of the arctangent function combined with tangent addition formulas. This gave anywhere between five to 16 digits, so pretty good. Uh, but then we got a huge upgrade with the integrals. The circle integral gave us more than 1,000 digits. And the next one, the Gaussian integral gave us over 150 digits, so it was slower. Now, both of these algorithms used integration algorithms already written out for us, so I should note that I did not write the integration stuff myself. And the final two, we had Chudnovsky with greater than 10,000 digits. And the last one, Gauss-Lazandra, gave us more than 100,000 digits. So there's our lineup of 10 pi approximation algorithms for Pi Day 2022. The code and links to all my sources will be in the description below, so make sure to check that out. If you have any questions or comments, leave them down below, and thank you for watching.